Well, good morning and welcome. It's good to be together. It's just rejoicing in the goodness of God. Let's begin this morning at the beginning. How about we do that? Let's go to the book of Genesis 1.1. Here's what God says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now notice, it doesn't say in the beginning God created the universe or that God created all things. He made a point to separate the heavens and the earth because they are separate and distinct and they serve the same purpose but in different ways. Now here's what David said about the heavens in Psalm 19 verse 1. The heavens are telling the glory of God. They are a marvelous display of his craftsmanship. Day and night they keep on telling about God. Now when we consider the heavens, all that God has made, we're going to focus today on probably the three big players in our universe from at least our perspective. And as a result of that, I want you to consider some things about the heavens. We're going to start with the sun. The sun is in the center. There is a center to our solar system because everything in God has a center. I have a center. My spirit man is the center. The throne of God is the center of all that he has made. It is the center of all things. The tree in the garden was the center of everything. The tabernacle and the ark were in the center always of the camp. God has put the sun in the center. There's always a center. Then there is an earth. The earth is where life plays out. And I want you to consider how God has set this up for us. The placement of the earth is absolutely perfect. If it was any closer or any farther away from the sun, it could not sustain life. God has set placement just so that life could prosper. So know this, wherever God places you, Now, not where you place you, but where God places you, you are in the best place to prosper, whatever that is, because the placement of God is always perfect. Also, there is movement with the earth. Thankfully, the earth moves, because if it didn't move, it would be dead, because living things move. That's what they do. In Him, we live and move, and we have our being. Now, the earth is moving in 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 a set journey. It has a set journey. It's not chaotic. It's not random. Uh, it's not sporadic. That The journey of the earth is always in a set pattern because everything in God has a set pattern and purpose to it. Then there is the orbit. The orbit is very intentional because everything in our solar system revolves around the sun. Because God is telling us that all life should have as its center the sun. All life, we were created that Jesus Christ, the sun, would be the center of our life. That's the only way to prosper. And this orbit, as it goes around, is telling us that one thing. The center. He should always be in the center. Now, there are a lot of people who say, Jesus is the center of my life, and then they're doing this. Or Jesus is the center of my life, and they're acting that way. That's possibly not so. When Jesus is the center, it shows. Now, there's also a rotation to the earth, and it's absolutely crucial because if we stopped rotating, the earth would die, and everything on it would die. So the rotating and the, uh, the tilting and the spinning and the revolving of the earth is absolutely crucial. And you say, well, Pastor Buddy, what is that telling us? Well, consider this. Here's David in 2 Samuel 6, 14. David danced, and he spun around with abandon before the Lord. The reason for all the spinning and all of the tilting is that ultimately God wants you to remember that you and I were created for worship, and we were created unto Him to worship Him. We were created, first and primary, to be worshipers unto Him. Not to do great things, but ultimately to be a worshiper. 
to lift praise and honor and glory unto him. So there is an orbit, and then there is a rotation, and all of this revolving is to remind us that at the very essence of life, it is worship. It is to lift him up. And then also the size of the earth is also instructional. Have you noticed that the earth is not the largest planet that there is? And God is telling us in that, hey, just remember, you don't want to put all of your energy, all of your investment, uh, all of your purpose, all of your meaning and significance into this life only because there's more than just this life. There are greater things other than this. But also, the earth is not the smallest one, as it were. And God is saying, look, you're always going to have some that have more, some that have less, some that see greater challenge, some that see less challenge, some that see more opposition, less opposition, greater prosperity, lesser prosperity. Because in creation, creation is not established according to fairness because fairness is what is right in our eyes but it is established according to God's goodness which is what is right in his eyes so in all of this speaking of fairness that goes on out there it doesn't line up with the first principles of God because God is about goodness he's about justice and that's what is right in his eyes as opposed to what is right in the eyes of men. So now we have this earth, and this earth is spinning, and it is moving around. Now, there is a third player. The player is, the third player is the moon. And here is what Genesis says in 116, God made two great lights, the greater light to have dominion over the day, the lesser light to have dominion over the night. So what do we know? Well, we know there are two great lights. Now notice, God calls both of them lights, but one of them is not really a light at all. One is a source of light. The other is just a reflector of light. There is no light in it. It cannot generate light. It cannot originate light. The moon, in fact, you wouldn't even know the moon was there if it were not for the sun. The moon is not a light. But both of these lights, as God says, have dominion over realms. One has dominion over the day, other has dominion over the night. Now, this is interesting because this is what Jesus said in John 11, verse number 9. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But he who walks in the night stumbles because there is no light in him. Notice, the reason there is no light in him, because you see, when I walk in the day, I walk under the dominion of Jesus Christ. If I walk in the night, I walk under the dominion of the adversary, the devil. One is light and one is night. Now, notice it says there is no light in him. The reason there is no light in people who walk in the night is because the one who has dominion over the night has no light in him either. Now, here is Jesus again. Dominions over realms. Oh, did you know that the greater light is 400 times bigger than the lesser light? Now, the way to compare that would be the head of a pen to a very large beach ball. That's the difference. So the greater light is very, very much greater, and the lesser light is not much at all. But there are times when the lesser light appears to be as big as the greater light. Have you ever walked outside and seen the moon in the sky and thought, wow, that's huge? No, it's not. It just looks that way. It just depends on your frame of reference and your perspective. Then the moon, the lesser light, affects the earth. It acts upon the earth. One of the things that it does, the moon, what does it do? It pulls. It pulls on us and it creates tides. So there is always this pull. In life, you get this pull. You feel it. It's there all the time. It's coming from that lesser light. It's there. But the other thing that it does is this. It's in, but it's also in the position, because every once in a while, the moon will get between the sun and the earth. And when it does that, it is trying to block out the light. Now, this is what we call a partial or a total eclipse. The moon gets between me and my sun, the Son of God. 
and the moon, when the moon gets between, it obscures or blocks out the light. That's what the word eclipse means. It means to obscure something or to block it out. Now, when that happens, the lights tend to go out. Here's what Jesus said in John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not been able to what? Overcome it. Because the darkness is the aggressor. The uh, darkness is the opposer. And so it, it means to defeat it or extinguish it or to get mastery over it. So the darkness is always trying to extinguish the light. Notice, it is unable to overcome it. And then Jesus said this in John 12, 35, Walk while you have the light so that the darkness doesn't overtake you. Well, if the darkness can overtake you, that means that it is the aggressor. It is the pursuer. And so what happens? when the moon gets between the earth and the sun. What does it mean when the light of God has been eclipsed momentarily in your life? Because trust me, it will happen. There will be times when the lights will simply go out. It will be momentary, it will be temporary, but it will happen. Every one of us experience these eclipse experiences in the spirit. So what does it mean? Why does God allow the moon, the lesser light, the adversary, to obscure and eclipse his light? Why would he ever allow that to happen? Let's find out. I want to give you today what I call, very simply, three little eclipse paradoxes. A paradox. A paradox is something that is true, but it doesn't sound true. It doesn't feel true. It doesn't seem true, but it is true. You wouldn't think it was true, but it is true. And so I want to give you some eclipse paradoxes today. All right, you ready? Here's the first one. We always see more in the dark. Yeah. Now look, the way you're looking at me, I can tell that's a paradox. Thank you. You have just confirmed it. What is happening here? Watch this. When the children of Israel encountered God on Sinai, we're going to go all the way to the book of Hebrews to find out what happened all the way back in the book of Exodus. Here it is. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. That mountain burned with fire, but... But where the people stood, it was completely dark. They could not see at all. So they're standing in the presence of God. God is on top of Mount Sinai. He has overwhelmed this mountain. He has totally possessed with his presence this mountain. But they are completely in the dark. The word obscurity and darkness is one way it's described. Blackness, murk, gloom, mist, dark clouds. However you want to describe it, it was black, complete blackness. They couldn't see anything. Now, here is Moses' response to that in verse 21. What Moses saw was so hard to look at that he said, I am full of fear and I am shaking. But, Pastor Buddy, what happened on Sinai? The single greatest revelation of God that they ever had occurred on Sinai. They saw God better in the dark than they did in the light. Let me tell you, when you are in the dark, you will always see God better than you do in the light. There is something about getting in the dark and walking through these obscure moments these mysterious times where you will see him better. Remember Job? Anybody want to trade places with him? No, I didn't think so. He walked through moments, weeks, days, weeks, who knows, months of absolute darkness. It affected every part of his life. 
He lost his family, almost lost his marriage, lost his possessions. His friends were absolutely no help at all. You know what he concluded when it was all over? Job 42.5, I had heard about you with my own ears, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. 41 chapters, he got a vision of God out of the darkness. You see, we're hoping it'll stay nice and light. God says, no, here comes an eclipse because I'm going to show you who I really am. In the dark, we will see him better. Samson needed a fresh vision. Saul needed a vision. Acts 9, verse 8. Saul got knocked off of his horse. He got up from the ground and opened his eyes, but he could not see. He is in total darkness. For three days, Saul could not see. Now, I want to show you how cute God is. I want to show you, he's working, he's messing around. <laughs> this man was totally blind for three days. Ananias was told by God, you go lay your hands on him, and I'm going to come on him. But don't you go for three days. I want him to sit in darkness for three days. Because what happened to him in those three days? The Bible says he ate nothing, he drank nothing. The only thing he fed on was a vision of Jesus Christ that was in his spirit. For three days, he saw nothing but Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, when he came out of that darkness, he turned the world upside down. What was number one? We always see more in the dark. Number two, we always know more in the dark. You want to get the best information and revelation from God? Get it out of the dark. Probably won't come out of your devotional. Probably come out of the dark. Watch. Acts, Acts 27, uh, 20. Paul's on a ship. Luke's probably there with him, writing all this stuff down. How in the world did I get hooked up with this guy? Verse number 20, it had been many days since we had seen either sun or stars. You know what you call that? Dark. Wind and waves were battering us unmercifully. I left that bit in just so you know. This is, this is dark. And we, we lost all hope of rescue. We, Luke is writing this. We, the doctor says, it's over. Paul's probably thinking, I think it's over. Everybody on the ship thought it was over. They had been in total pitch black dark for two weeks. Well, make that 13 days. But in the dark, God spoke. Not when the sun was shining. In the dark. Now notice, here he is. He's doing it again. He didn't speak on the first day. He didn't speak on the third day. Now, that would have been very spiritual. And the third day, we got a word. No. He didn't speak on the seventh day. That would have been a grand opportunity. This is a day of completion. It's a day of perfection. This is the day when we're going to receive our word. Nothing. He did not speak on the tenth day. The time of judgment, bringing everything together. He spoke on the 13th day. When did he do it? Acts 27, verse 23, Paul said, as he is speaking on the 14th day, last night. Oh, he didn't even bother to speak during the day. It doesn't matter because it's dark, but God said, I'm going to wait till it's really, really dark. Last night, an angel of God stood by me. Well, where were you for two weeks? I've been in the dark. 
I could have used a word on the second day that I'm going to actually get through this. No, no. Thirteenth night. The angel stood by me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. Now, if an angel tells you, Do not be afraid, you should listen. But if an angel tells you, Do not be afraid, it's probably because you are. Either that or he's wasting his breath. Notice, present tense, do not be afraid. You must stand in front of Caesar. Future tense. Right? You're going to Caesar. That's ahead of you. Which means you're not dying. The dark is not going to consume you. And... God has given you the lives of all of the men on this ship. Past tense. He already did it. You see, when you get in the dark, God gives up the greatest promises you will ever get are when it's dark. The greatest words, the greatest prophetic utterances of God will always come in the midst of great darkness. Well, maybe if I added a brownie to that, I could sell it. Here's Paul. So take hope, men. I believe my God will do what he has told me. Oh, you see. Oh, I need a word from God. Yeah. Oh, I, I would love to have another word. From God. Well, watch out because it's probably going to get dark. Some of the greatest words you will ever hear from God will come out of the darkness. It will not be while you're standing by the throne. The lights went out for Abraham, Genesis 15, 12. Now this is a man who's obeying God. He's following God. Now, this is a man who is a friend of God, right? You want to be friends with God? Let's keep reading. When the sun was setting, God said, I want you to bring all this stuff and cut it in half and lay it all these animals out here, lay it out, and I'll meet you there. Okay, simple. When the sun was setting, a deep sleep overcame Abram, and a horror, a terror, a shuddering fear of great darkness assailed and oppressed him. Great darkness. Hey, I'm supposed to be following Jesus. I'm supposed to be a friend of God. How can all of this be happening to me? Here is how it is described. Terrible darkness, deep darkness, terrifying darkness. A great dark hideousness assailed him. And you can take that one to the bank because that's Wycliffe. A great dark hideousness assailed him. In the midst of that, God spoke to him. Out of the darkness, in the darkness. And he said... I'm going to tell you what is going to happen 400 years from now. I'm speaking into your future. You see, when God comes and speaks in the darkness, He's automatically telling you, we ain't staying here. We're going on. We're moving out of this. We're going to get into my purposes and fulfill my purposes. He told him, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen 400 years from now, and I'm also going to tell you that all of those ites that you see in the land, I have already given them to you and your descendants, present, past, and future. Lights went out for Daniel. Daniel was in a den of darkness. Regardless of all the artwork, regardless of all the Baroque pictures of Daniel sitting on a stone, petting the lions, <laughs> it was pitch black in there. They moved the stone, dropped him down in a hole, and put the stone back. No lights. All he heard was... In the dark, 
all of a sudden, somebody bumps him. And it wasn't a lion. The angel of God. In the dark. Daniel went in that hole in the first year of Darius. Very important. The angel spends the night with Daniel. What are we going to do? Well, let's talk. Let's just talk. He went around, touched all the lions, and they talked. Daniel got more revelation and vision from God in one night in a dark lion's den than all the rest of his life. I challenge you, look at the book. Watch what he says. In the first year of Darius, I got this. In the first year of Darius, the Lord showed me that. In the first year of Darius, there was this vision. In the first year of Darius, I spoke these words. Why? Because God was giving him vision in the middle of the darkness. This is why Jesus said to us, What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. Matthew 10, 27, Whatever you hear from me and you got it in the dark, go ahead. Profess it. Confess it. Claim it. Declare it. It's good. It's a promise. And it'll see you all the way through. Number three, we always find more in the dark. How's that possible? Like this. Jacob sent his family over the brook Jabbok. Uh, Jabbok brook means the place where I just get emptied out. He sent everybody over. He's standing there. Genesis 32, 24. Jacob was left alone and a man. Uh-oh, here they are again. Have you ever noticed how people get in the dark and God shows up? Wonder why that is. Huh. Because he's doing stuff. God works better in the dark than he does in the light. A man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now notice, you see this man, I believe it was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ that met him. This angel of the Lord was under strict instructions. You can only wrestle him in the dark. If, if daylight comes, you're done. You cannot accomplish anything at daybreak. Everything has to be done in the dark. This is why the angel said to him in verse 26, let me go, for it is daybreak. He's telling him, I'm done. My purpose is accomplished. Because what happened, happened in the dark. Well, what happened in the dark? Jacob got a touch that he had never had before. He touched him. God touched him. He, he got a blessing that he'd never seen before. He got a name that he'd never had before. He got authority and anointing that he had never seen before in his life. You say, Pastor Buddy, how do you know? Because when he starts journeying, the villages and towns in Genesis 35 would not raise their arm against him because of the anointing that was on him that he got in the dark. Not in the pulpit. Not in the choir. He got it in the dark. What happened when Samson lost his vision? Judges 16, 21, the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes. Total dark. Done. Finished. Black. Black. What happens in the black? What happens in the dark? <laughs> Here's what happened to him. Verse number 30. The number of enemies that he killed at his death in the dark was greater than the number of Philistines he had killed during the rest of his life. There was an acceleration there was an advancement, just like with Jacob. There was a progression. He went through a dark moment, a dark time, but God accelerated him into more. Now you know 
why God doesn't mind the moon getting in front of the sun. Doesn't mind it at all. Because God says, hey, I do my greatest work in the dark. I, I can speak greater words in the dark. I can give greater things in the dark. I can accomplish more when it's dark. With one proviso in the fifth-week notice, God works best in the dark when we allow Him. Father, I thank you for paradoxes that send the enemy into a conniption. He can't even fathom, can't function, can't. It, it can't process this at all. How is it possible that the saints of God, the followers of Jesus Christ, can go through momentary darkness, temporary dark, and come out so much more anointed, so much more equipped, with a greater vision of God? Say, Pastor Buddy, I need a greater vision of God. Well, are you willing to get in the dark? Are you willing for the lights to go out momentarily? You see, tomorrow, 33 million people in America are going to witness an eclipse. 33 million. They all know it's coming. Can't find a hotel room in this town. It's going to be a madhouse. But historically, when people don't know that an eclipse is coming, do you know what their reaction is? It's over. This is it. This is the end of my world. You see, God never announces his eclipses. He never tells you next week it might get dark. You just find yourself there. And our first natural inclination is to say, oh no, this is the end of me. No. Father, I thank you. You have beat the devil at his own game. It's no wonder that you say I form the light and I create darkness. Because you have defeated darkness. You have destroyed the works of darkness. And you have caused even the darkness to produce amazing things in the world. Because you're Lord. You're the Son. You're 400 times bigger. You're greater. You're the center of all things. And I thank you for dark moments, dark seasons, because I'm going to see you more. I'm going to hear you. I'm going to gain promises from you. And I'm going to find a greater eclipse. be in a dark place right now. Just know. Agree with this verse. I'm going to see God in this. I'm going to see God better than I ever have. I'm going to hear Him. I'm going to hear what He's saying. He's pronouncing prophetically over my life, even as I'm in this dark moment. And I'm going to come out of this accelerated that he said. Let him be. Honor him in the dark. Because what he tells you in the dark, declare it. You can go to the bank. 